Mr. Kojima, we're about to start the simulation in one, two, three. Man, goddamn vector wireframe and bare pixel graphics. I think the last time I saw anyone even acknowledge these was Suda51's Travis Strikes Again in 2019, and before that, uh, Geometry Wars? Guess it's cause these have just kind of faded into obscurity. People will remember asteroids for sure, and whenever someone goes all, what's the first first person shooter ever made? They'll see folks talk about that one tank game thingy, but generally the cold fuzzy glow of wireframe graphics has very much been booted back to a thing of the past. And yet, I do feel that there's a fun appeal to them. I mean, if you bring colors into the equation and are using the right type of screen, it's almost as if one seeing neon come to life right in front of your eyes. And besides, they're also razor sharp as shit in a way that graphics rendered otherwise can never quite be, which makes them rather unique once beheld in person. And limited and goofy though they often are, I could absolutely see them brought back as a deliberately evoked aesthetic technology allowing. Especially because there's also kind of an eerie element there, isn't there? That dark abyss always gazing back into thine soul and the bleak nakedness akin to the graphical equivalent of skeletons. And skeletons? Dang, that's pretty spooky. And so, naturally, as natural as this intuitively written segue, glowy skeletal darkness and shrouded neon wire frames are the exact eerie backbone that the Metal Gear series chose for its meta. Wow, little girl. You have a cute dress on, but you should go home before you ruin your dress. Metal Gear Solid actually started development on the fucking 3DO of all things under the name Metal Gear 3. Not much is known about this version, let alone shown, but in between it moving from there and running fully on PS1, there was the Shadow Era. In which, much like most game reveals today, we see mere concepts of the game running on what is not the actual proprietary hardware. And what's really neat about this reveal, aside from the lighting, better models, and amazingly stylish UI, is that you actually see the early Snake Man's Guard Man's concepts, and there's some VR missions looking shit right there, innit? Given the overall very meta vibes of the trailer intersplicing dev tool footage with the actual gameplay, it makes me wonder wonder if perhaps this would have played a much greater role into the actual narrative at one point, as it certainly does in Solid the Second, and it also woulda coulda made MGS1's gameplay a bit more meaty. Cause I mean, it's no secret that it kinda loses the script on its own mechanics a little bit, but yeah, we start off with the trademark Lego-based Snake Man's Guard Man's for sure, but after only a couple hours it more or less transforms into a string of set pieces and sequences, which I love, but perhaps the level designers of Metal Gear 3 had buckets of concepts that went unused, thus ending up in VR, come 3 become solid. Metal Gear is as it is, and solid has a deep meaning. Let me explain. This time, Metal Gear is displayed in full polygonal form, and I used solid to describe the cubic structure. <laughs> also, the solid means to the third power mathematically. Most people don't know that there is a Metal Gear 1 and 2 for the MSX, and I wanted it to be a sequel for those, and, of course, Solid from Solid Snake. <laughs> what? Look, I know creativity is iterative, and meaning usually only comes after the initial idea, though, like, He's saying it as if the last bit wasn't the actual reason. I mean, this is like if Iwata was talking about the Switch, would have gone all... You see, Switch 
has a deeper meaning because to turn on the light you need a switch a light switch and so the switch is the illumination that i felt the game industry needed but it also represents the creative spark i felt when i envisioned the switch furthermore the switch also represents electricity as does light old crt tvs used light and electric rays to convey an image onto the screen and the switch is also a screen but also it's because you can switch between handheld and tv like yeah but <laughs> but also no though you did not think all that initially if one thing is the light and electric rays however it is this wire framey virtual world a deconstructive meta mode where code spills onto the screen. Gameplay so naked as if a look behind the scenes. I do the latter later in ways I'll get to later, but for now it's worth sticking to telling you what we're sticking to. Being the side missions within MGS1 itself and the standalone release that went buck wild with this concept. Said concept being military VR training, but also I'd imagine cutting costs. Thing is, it's honestly kind of disgusting how money the base game looks on PS1. Just in the opening cutscenes alone with the pressure releasing from Snake Silo, the bubbles bubbling up, the whole screen undulating and all the cool post-processing effects and wild particle usages. This ain't shit you saw back then. Like, this is what people were actually used to back then. Cheesy. Cheesy for the PS1. Easy. So, I think it's really interesting how comparatively stripped back the VR stuff is, likely due to making more levels on base game fidelity just not being in the cards being that. When you get right down to it, Shadow Moses is decently small and they already had to double disc this bitch what with all those audio files and all. Granted, that isn't to say that I think these look boring in any capacity, in fact I super dig the vibes. I am with the turquoisean gradient hues on the black panels emanating off of the lines as they pulsate with flying lights whizzing by, with skies built of data and guards lit strikingly from below. So then when you to you needing to use the actual sneaking mechanics, it results in some rather stylishly framed cinematic wall-lean views. Love the application of the old Metal Gear musics as well to really invoke them classic MSXian sneakages. I mean, you don't hear that many people speak that highly of Metal Gear 2, mainly because you don't hear that many people speak about it at all, but I fucking adore that game and how snappy and instantly gratifying its pacing is. It's a stealth game, but it ain't slow, it, it has arcadey action in its blood still, and I feel very much that same design intent in these VR mode missions. Quick, timed, bite-sized puzzle chunks of high-stakes action sneaking unmuddied by lengthy diatribes and Kojima poo-poo-pee-pee -pee moments. Well, for the most part, at least. Ugh, kind of damn cold. I hate Alaska. Boy, oh boy, that woman is built all right. Oh, god damn, the gravity on this title screen. You'd think when you'd make a standalone expansion disc of what was ostensibly the tutorial mode, they'd scale back the epicness a little bit, but no, nah, they fucking doubled down. Which I think it deserves, honestly, as the player will see and do things in these that they won't likely find anywhere else. You see, the original MGS1 is a rather simple movement type of game. Crouch, crawl, lean up walls, shoot first person, shoot with tracking, but no rolls, no leans, and fancy hanging maneuvers, no trank gun either, and no advanced CQC. Because of this, I find it quite a fair bit more difficult than anything released there after- No, no, no! Usually, when I get caught, I tend to just sort of give up. No point fighting a fight I know I can't win, and even if I could, I would not think it worth to waste my limited resources. I do like it, but I was dreading the VR missions, being that the disc functions as a pure LEGO levels-based extract. 
However, there is no resources, no losing progresses, and no codex to skip. So none of that ever got in the way of me enjoying this toy box of level design, where what that simple movement and moveset could or can be used for is expanded upon greatly. Cause it's like, sure, stealthy placing bombs to blow up guards without getting caught is almost absolutely the intended way to play, but who's to say you can't place those while being shot at? Not to mention that outside of one story-based place for C4, I don't think I used it at all in the main game campaign, but here there are several series of missions based entirely around the titular item. Or take Arif's Hole, for example. That's not just a one-off gimmick now, we got a whole ass whole world. Or it having breakable glass tech that I'm pretty sure is only used to fancify the ninja fight, that now has some really technically impressive sniper-based missions based around it. And it's even using the infrared sensors thing during the actual sneaking instead of it being off to the side or in one-off basement rooms. Stuff like this and more I will soon discuss is mainly the product of the sheer volume of missions at display here, thus basically forcing the designers to get playful with it that then forces the players to get playful with it too. Boasting entire sets of shit centered around each of the various weapons. And then there's levels that then entirely recontextualize those weapons. And then there's stuff that entirely reframes Snake's basic abilities and shit that even entirely completely reshapes what type of game this is in general. Though I do think some of these highlight that maybe the combative capabilities in MGS1 ain't always that great. Like the handgun is just auto-aim, pray and spray. You can't first person it, so doing target practice with those is a little bit meh. But then I also can't deny how incredibly dumb fun the C4 missions are, where it's just like, okay, let me slowly and quietly place all these bombs and... My introduction to this series actually was this trailer on a demo disc that ended with a big ass C4 sequence that had fuck all to do with anything actually offered in game. But I wouldn't know that, and thus all the same, me and a friend were literally yelling at the TV like, yeah, 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 we gotta play this bro, we gotta play this, based off of that alone. So it was very fucking cute for me to see at least a version of that present here. To be fair to MGS1, unless you were to blow up all of Shadow Moses, there wouldn't be much reason to use C4 like this. Same way I don't think there'd ever be much application for building a claymore wall around yourself because the guards would just gun you down, but these little pylon things won't know what to do. So in that sense, I think these are actually really great as well as... Again, they allow the designers and the players to explore how Metal Gear works more than what more grounded game worlds would allow for. Blah. Yo, dog, do you want some snake meat? Uh, snake meat? <laughs> yeah, dog. Snake meat. And let me fucking tell ya, grounded this ain't. As first of all, we got Turbo Mode. Within which, freakishly for PS1 standards, high-res models of either Naomi or Mei Ling stand in the middle of a, quite frankly, frighteningly similar to MGS2's Arsenal Gear deck-like space, surrounded by a creeper barrier, of course, so that the player may only... look at them and take pictures. Real shit, though, is getting to play as the Cyborg Ninja. Does it play like shit? Yes. But is it cool as fuck? Yes. Stiff jumping, hacking, slashing, electrifying in cool original environments, it's really neat. You also gain access to the holy mother of fuck of god level C4 trailer that, despite being beta ass and mid-dev Andy is so beyond anything the game can do that they were using all of the debug tools to put weapons in places that they'll never be in while using the camera camera in ways that wouldn't even be practical playing, but god motherfuck is it so goddamn cool. But then, also, mystery missions, where one has to solve mysteries. As, as in, uh, oh no, uh, someone is dead, but the murderer happened to knock over a camera. Who could it be? No way. 
No fucking way. That's it, Sora. You're going to jail, Buster. Pick me one last time of your sea salt ice cream, you little bitch. There's also a really neat chase sequence one where through the power of death, one has to figure out the strandy route the perp takes so you can take a alt route to catch the correct gunning soldier. And there's even a... Oh, poor Johnny had caught himself a body to hide among the masses, he thought the little naughty. However, Johnny's ass was perked up to go potty, and thus Snake knew who was the shoddy pooping perp so that he could apprehend the clumsy murdering jerk. Oh, poor Johnny. Oh, poor pooping Johnny. Uh, and then it, it drops the VR pretense and puts Snake in a full-on classic murder mystery room where gathering clues is of the essence. The time, the pizza, the corpse, the TV, and so on. This, this is so goddamn cool. I fucking adore all of these mysteries, to be honest. They're so wacky and creative and really using the mechanics as well as the impressive visual quality for its time in boundary-pushing ways. Which can be said even more unhingedly so for the puzzle missions that really stress your knowledge of the most deepest inner workings of Metal Gear. Because I mean, right in the first one, I was already stumped. Bunch of guys on distant platforms, all of them needed to die, but you only get hand grenades, so that was like... Uh, Okay, can I somehow throw grenades different? Skip them like a rock across water or something? But no, I had to do this. And that's fucking nuts to me, dog. Some of these defo feel like you're doing things the game wasn't intended for and can thus feel a little bit jank, especially when the quote-unquote physics are involved. But there's big explosions, there's running through walls of glass, guns ablazing by running and gunning, which I didn't even know you could do in this one. Just as I had no clue you could get motherfuckers to quit struggling by only subtly choking them, thus letting you drag them way further. There's just such a sickening depth to this thing that was never really explained or even needed, but I already feel like now, post having played this, I could totally run through MGS1 like a complete fucking sicko, exploiting every crumb of complexity and making the entire game my bitch. Although, I suppose, nothing Thing I would face there could ever rival him. What's dope as well is that a fair few of the ideas here, like the Nikita missile shit, the glass breaking shit, throw the listening to a dude's heartbeat to find him and getting the ninja sword or the blonde hair disguisey, are all things later explored more metally and core in Ghost Bay Bowl 2 and 3 and I think that's super fucking cool. As not only does that give more depth to the gameplay centric twists of 2, but also lets you see what are ostensibly basic workshopped outlines of future games' ideas in this playful playbox as game designer's fetish of a game. Ah! Th th that's also really strange and quite frankly a wee bit creepy too. hearing and seeing right now is some music I'm doing for a book. It, like the book, will chronicle the development of video games from the 70s all the way through modern day. The book will do this with words and I will do it with sounds. It'll drop on 7-inch alongside the physical literature and it should be pretty cool. 
I'll also be writing for another one of these on horror games, which will also feature words from big name people like Mara and Toby Fox. It will own, and links will be in the pinned comments. Now, back in the early 2000s, when I was a little kid, I remember hearing a lot about the dangers of computer viruses. This little dude at school, fucking Dennis, would tell me about the I love you virus, and how it would destroy your entire computer. This sounded terrifying to me. Like, for one, I love you, that's a nice thing. But now, it's evil, which is deceitful and tricksy. And for two, we didn't have a computer at home yet due to poverty, nor did we have internet. So, in my ignorance, the virus part to me sounded much more literal than it was. As if it was actually airborne or something, right? To the point that I'd fear it would somehow infect the computers that I did know. I.e. my console. So then, picture me carefreely playing my new Spyro game on MeCube. Sure, I could tell something about it was a little bit freaky, but I didn't care, cause it's Spyro. Fuck yeah, Spyro is my friend, and he would never betray me. And there it was, what I thought was a computer virus. Spyro drifting out of his world, and my feelings sinking. Actual, real, palpable fear rushing from my toes up to my head as I rushed to turn the console off. And this would be far from the only thing like it that would spook me on Cube. I mean, despite that C4 trailer, Twin Snakes would be the first game I'd buy not really knowing what in the series was what yet, and you'd best believe that it breaking the fourth wall and hitting me with... <laughs> Mario sightings oh, was the scariest shit I had seen up until then. Not to mention what 2 would do on PS2. Uh, no less how eerie the PS2 was to begin with. Now, the thing with this series is that it being meta is very core to its lore, primarily due to a MacGuffin called Nano Machines. Nano Machines? Yeah, and these can do a lot, as they're basically just the gameplay as a overlay altering the in-universe reality. Be careful. You absolutely must not use weapons in that area. I've already programmed the nanomachine so that he won't be able to, Colonel. Exactly. Because of this, it can make the non-canon feel canon and the fourth wall breaking being it very much staying intact just as much. The MSX in MGS5, the fission mailed in 2, the time paradox in 3, shit like that. So who's to say the VR mode isn't also just snake training pre-mission, just as how Raiden has in 2, or how the paradox reframes 3 as snake modern day getting a VR down low on his daddy in the past. It could be like, well now, no, that was just a little joke game over, or Tor, come on, the VR modes is just a dumb little mini games, which sure, but you still can't always easily tell if it's explicitly non-canon or not due to the meta nanos, and that to me gives not just these meta missions, eerie, glitchy, kid me, virusy connotations, but also MGS the second as a whole, as this shit is intrinsically woven into the DNA of its themes and story. Man, look at this little bit. But, but beca beca because it's like, so like Raiden, right? Raiden is like a player allegory for gamer demasculation. So it's like, <laughs> Lamau, gay, uh, not manly type beat for the gamers, you know? Genius Kojima. But anyway, Raiden is a player stand-in, yeah? Uh, so then it's also like all the arsenal gear areas are like stomach, sigmoid colon, ascending colon, and eventually rectum. So my theory is, is, is that this is supposed to be the player going up their own ass or, or, uh, I mean, Snake is here too with Raiden, double teaming. And Snake in this game is like, 
a Kojima mouthpiece, at least during the ending where, where he says the smart stuff, despite losers always thinking that the AI is saying the smart stuff. Uh, he very implicitly is, you know? He's like a Kojima stand-in to some degree. So, uh, is it Kojima going up his own ass, mouth first? Or, or is it Kojima rim-jobbing the player? Is, is that why it looks like the Pervo mode from the PS1 VR missions? Um, wow. Who's to say? But it's such a deep game. So many layers to this ending. You wouldn't be trying to give yourself a bogus score using some ingenious trick, would you? Ooh, well, I mean, I, I did use Game Shark codes to unlock everything, as fuck doing all of that shit raw. The graveyards are huh. And none of this even accounts for the pump room or the deep ah. sea dock. When I first played MGS2 as yet again, still a dumb child in the early aughts, I was very much stuck for a long time on the tanker segment. I'd play it over and over on very easy mode, somehow never knowing how to get to the tanker hold. One day, though, I felt adventurous and thus started messing with the settings of what it asks you when you new game. Tanker or plant, first time or new player or whatever. I couldn't read English too well yet either, so I just picked whatever wasn't what I normally picked and hit play. Snake, do you remember the sinking of that tanker two years ago? Of course. Wait. Blow a hole in an oil tanker full of Wait, what? 20 miles off the shore of Manhattan. What, what is this? I said to myself as my feelings sank once again. Why is this eerie static colonel man here? Why is this scary man with the scary gas mask being called snake they call this the skull suit in fox no that sounds way too scary no cap all caps i legit once again thought that some proper freak shit was happening to my console as if i was being hacked and that the game that i love was being changed into a evil spooky version and yeah 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 i, I know how dumb that sounds but again i was very young and to my credit the game was pretending to be downloading things a lot as well. I mean, tell me this doesn't look at least kinda like something fucked up is happening to your PS2 right now? It's the equivalent of me suddenly going in a video. That's basically MGS2's bread and butter right there. Right in, turn the game console off now and shit like that. And that adds a lot of layering to these fun little side excursions, if you ask me. As already here, when it showed me exactly what Raiden's training was, I was looking at the very same missions I was playing just the other fucking day before. Intersplicing them with scenes of trailers and demos and cut content and other non-canon off-the-side things, all of a sudden recontextualized and dragged, glitching and graining into this very canon Metal Gear plot. Therefore, when Colonel Campbell goes all Variety Level 13 Rescue Meryl, the return of Ginola You bet that my body was Reggie For Metal Gear Solid 2's VR missions substance of D, snake. Two things set up the contexts created for this content. One being that the base game did not have any VR missions in it, only the substance version, which ships on two discs rich with that and other goodies I will cover thusly. And two, MGS2 as a whole is far less set PC due to the big shell structure of each strut being a self-contained unique snake man's guard man's lego level setup created for the context of teaching the player and showing off the ridiculous complexity of movement and items this bitch containeth. I mean, uh, look at Snake from MGS1 in the mirror. Ducking, jiving a little, but none too wild, right? Compare that to 2's Raiden just going completely fucking berserk with it in every which way. Wall leaning, hanging, pull upping, rolling, dashing, walking, and running, cause analog control. That also extends to the buttons with pressure sensitivity used for lowering weapons once propped up, or aiming pre-shooting, or the difference between popping up a menu or quick equipping, not to mention all of those 
playing into how loud or visible you are or can be while maneuvering, or first person aiming, which has now been added to all weapons. They're swimming, sorta, kinda, water physics. P physics. P physics. Hello Items is multi-use as well, like coolant spray, freeze bomb, put out flames, scare away bugs, or gas up boys. And said boys are also roided out to shit now, mentally speaking, requiring a snake to schmoove, move, and move bodies into lockers. Like, look at their cute little search and scan routines. Aww. The environment also matters even more now. What was that noise? Led to wetnesses, slipperinesses, lightingses, shadowses, shooting individual itemses, and having them break apart either just for fun or to cause a funny little leak to expose some lasers. I suppose things can be a tad gimmicky, maybe, but then also just, just take, take a, a look, look at, at this. this. This has to be one of my favorite hallways of all time, with its carefully placed lighting sheath simulations on walls, their reflections on floor and the light emanating from alongside the rims of the ceiling, causing wee shadows to be cast from the railings, all amounting to a beautiful complexity of color and hue with its tastefully darkening in the distance. Mwah. With fidelity like this, you're bound to maximize your spaces to make for some real Great, goaded, stealth design, optimized for sneaky, tense, quiet, on-site procurement gameplay. And because all this is plenty present as is in natural play, even if the practical use cases don't often extend much further than just a single strut, the VR missions don't have to pull a base game MGS1 and basically be tutorials. Hmm. Uh, is this what I think it is? <gasps> oh my god, it is. Uh, you know, I guess that's one way to flex on everyone that your insano cutscenes are all in engine. Okay, so while the VR missions might not use the P physics in any creative way, they do very much start with advanced tactics right from the jump. For instance, the first level you get involving hanging isn't simply hang from the railing to get by the guy, cause the story will handle that part, so now it's already expecting you to know to use it to use it to knock dudes out. And these ain't easy either, to be honest. Guess with analog complexities and needs to aim the weapons missions are tougher by default, uh, even if they do all default to shooting galleries, which I find a little lame, but just merely getting by motherfuckers with nothing but empty magazines is quite a fun can of worms to cautiously open. The proverbial sneak meat, if you will. Grenades and C4 shit also is mostly just a repeat of last time, and while I dig how the Nikita levels is now and how they gradually expand upon the one little instance they're used in using their new first person elevation functionality to greater effect, it is also only five missions, as, yeah, honestly, I don't think the VR here is where the substance of substance is at. And uh, don't get me wrong, I really love the bomb disposal levels, getting the player to nook and cranny places they may not have had a chance to in story, and Raiden's cyber map version of the tanker is also a cute little meta nod, and equally, I really loved getting to use the high frequency blade more, even if it is a little bit awkward to control, cause there's just so much novelty here that keeps it from being a repeat. Unless the repeating is also a cute little meta nod. Uh, anyway, there is fun stuff in here is what I'm saying. I may not have gotten to it cause fuck getting all of the highest scores, but there's even a mecha Ginola in here somewhere. And even some really horrific first person missions where I could explain the controls, but I think the footage of me struggling to align myself with some holes kind of speaks for itself. Shit had more in common with fucking Echo Knight or whatever than any shooter I've ever played, and in that, I respect them a shit ton. Besides, it all looks great. So jazzy, groovy, and sleek Y2K techno future with once again meta Nodian default pro Darian textured walls, things in sky that look like these Photoshop brushes that I have, and cool 
cool orange cell shaded guards that pair up great with the gray. Honestly, really reminded me of Metal Gear Acid 2 stylistically, which I must say is a good thing. However, but and although, what made me want to do this video is three core memories that I have. Well, three screenshots even, that I used to see in magazines. The first was a shot of the ninja leaning up against a wall from VR missions. The second is these two cool mystery womans from, I think, Metal Gear Online? And the third is this screenshot of Meryl in the tanker. I saw that as a kid and it caught my mind racing like, what? How? Huh? Whoa! Oh my god! Having no idea how to get to it only owning the OG version. And here's the thing, it's not in VR, as it is, in fact, a part of the Snake Tales, which is a wholly separate menu option consisting out of cute what-if scenarios. Some of these, like the VR missions, I can't say I'm all too fond of either, like... Uh, whoa, what if Snake was in the big shell is kind of novel, but it's also kind of like, yeah, okay, I guess. And even something with a title card as hard as... Ain't really all that spectacular, despite it being about a ghost haunting the big shell. This is, in part, as... A, I just don't think I enjoy how hard these are, being that you're snake with no node, so no map, and B, there's also no cutscenes, you just get text dumped upon, so you won't be seeing any ghosts either. Aww. Yeah, and they're all like this. Even the Meryl one just had this one shot, THE shot even, in action, only to then jump back to text. I get it though, but as later things in this video with custom codex will show, it is possible to be neat and not necessarily have too shit effort. But as it is, I, I just take it getting all those actors back probably would have costed hella. What is quite interesting, I guess, is that this is already running with the idea that Campbell's daughter monologue ain't real, which is something I didn't think they'd have already planned out so far before 4. On the other hand, <laughs> she is also on Gerlukovich's side now, upon which I remember it that this is all bullshit and none of this is canon anyway. Rescue Meryl, the return of Ginola. Although, if Ginola can be canon, then why not also? The monster from another dimension, Gurnga! Otacon and Mei Ling have sent Solid Snake off to the offshore cleanup facility, Big Shell, to take pictures of a mythical monster sighted nearby. However, not all is as it seems. You see, Snake's been testing this new VR tech for Otacon, doing a little bomb diffusion and a little bit of wanton murder. It runs on the Copplethorne engine, a engine designed by Dr. Copplethorne, the soon-to-be villain of Metal Gear Acid 2. And, as such, it has been giving Snake hallucinations. Could the Gurlugan monster even be real? But then, Olga from a alternate universe appears, telling us that Gurlugan is also from a alternate universe. The Coppeltorn VR world. Is this why the guard's shading was a bit similar to Acid 2, a game that wouldn't be out for years? Eh, probably not. But it's neat to think that they based Acid 2's world off of this dumb bullshit, as that is a alternate universe game. Though, yeah, you fight Girl Logan in VR and then it throws a bunch of bullshit at you. I like it. This is easily the funnest one of the Snake Tales and the creative vibe I'd hope to see more of in MGS2 side content, but you know, still a little bit mid, at the very, very least.
when booting up the skateboarding minigame English only. It's pretty apparent from the resolution switch, its display field being lower and the whole UI and vibe being different that this is booting into a other game entirely. As cause this ain't just some goofy ass minigame made for fun, it's actually a little demo. The full game of which being the Konami made and published Evolution Skateboarding a very stiff and floaty tone clone with animations and momentum that don't quite cohesively link up in the most fluidly feeling way reviewed like shit and sold accordingly and is now really only remembered for it having various konami crossovers by which i mean people remember the skating minigame from mgs2 substance and usually don't even know that it is a demo as it isn't at all advertised as such the name evolution skateboarding isn't mentioned anywhere control screen skunk pfps loading tape tags and off you go schmoozing across the big shell as either raiden or snake <laughs> too bad emma you won't be skating today <laughs> for what it's worth as a skate level shit is kind of excellent i mean there's heaps of neat touches such as the gaps in strut bridges being cool transitions grinds and jumpses or it turning the ciphers into wacky takedownable mini objectives in general i'd also say that the big shell shapes make for good half pipey and bowl configurations with rims of ramps and circularities in center not to mention all the elevation and grindy staircases its many floors provide. It even has the rations and the dog tags to collect. And, 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 you can use the fucking cranes! I've been looking at these motherfuckers for years being like... Wow. The cranes. And now I finally get to use them for something. Fuck yeah. Also, recontextualizing the Semtex as something you do want to trigger, being that this results in a dope sequence where you get to blow a whole strut up, which is also one of those things you don't really get to see ever despite it happening in plot, is honestly pretty cute and creative too. Sadly, all of this takes place in evolution skateboarding, but if someone could export this map to Thug Pro, it would go off, I bet. As yeah, I did smoke the full game and Go! well turning santorini into a stage is pretty baller swag i suppose in fact i'm down with every level to be honest the cozy xmas the bashing snowmen and skating on ice or exploring cool sunny ruins as Frogger, rope railing, ridge grinding to higher and higher levels, or Gurlo gunning up the western dust on horse watch. It's all really lively, and this is probably also the only skateboarding game that can claim to have a Dracula boss fight in it, which has to stand for something. It's all very big, vibrant, and creative with a cool exploratory feel. Seeing as it's not just about grinding out scores, and even that I think it does facilitate decently with how grinds, jumps, pipes, and bowls can link up and stuff. It's just that, well, you know. Big airs can be fun if you can get them at all with how heavy shit is, but otherwise it doesn't play much better than the snake demo. But what it does have is soul. It has swag. That said, if you think skateboard menu Raiden looks a little off, then wait until you get, get a load, load of beta hey. Raiden. Dude actually looks cool, which was not the goal. One can find this man on the second demo disc included with substance called The Document of Metal Gear. A making of disc not to be confused with the making of disc that shipped with the OG release of 2. D DVD extreme mode? Ooh, okay. I love this look of gray and, and dirty orange. Or the black and orange featured thereafter. Pairing with this cool dual scrolling acronym and detail that once wire framey menu. Mwah. The depth of this CD's many options it has is quite unhinged, if I may say. Showing off everything from what a normal day working at the Konami Gulags must have looked like to this ridiculous model viewer that let me notice shit I never would have caught on to otherwise. Like how Snake's raincoat from the intro reacts very dopely to lighting, which one can change, of course. Hell, there's like shit in here that isn't even used or referenced at all in the final product. Like the Shinkawa drawing textured characters or the actual Shinkawa drawings. Like, 
like this one, which I, I think is alluding to a edgy Penguin Adventure reboot. Like, like Kojima's first game. There's also reference images for some designs, which is really cool as well. Being that I find it quite interesting to see the discrepancies in how, say, pretty Shinkara Raiden is versus his dopier in-game model. Or how Otacon looks gruff and manly when drawn, but really never gets there in 3D. Or how anime e early roses as opposed to where she ended up is neat. I'm also with how the Colonel, being what he is in 2, doesn't even have a full body and yet they gave him this wee old school foxhound patch which i don't think the codec angles would ever be able to show it's one of those things where it's like yeah be resourceful but also put that love and care in there you know honestly how high res he is also takes me back a bit i mean i figured the codex would have more simple models but considering that raiden or snake don't appear to have exclusive codec models they must have just always used the full things maybe swapping motherfuckers in frame, like how it also swerf swoops the camera to first person in real time as well. For all we know, the cutscenes, gameplay, and calls all use the same models, which is quite rare for a game to do, especially one of AAA fidelity. Speaking of which, it's also possible to see through some of the beta characters that the polygon count slowly increased over the course of development. In game vamp versus Dreamcast Andy beta vamp really highlights that I feel. He also used to be a woman for a bit, so, you know, good to see the T really helped him out. Ah, uh, hell yeah, bro. Now that's badass! Something I had never fully internalized until now is how the Gerlukovich boys is all dressed up in grey on Big Shell, but are brown on Tanker. This is likely due to Olga having a very grey theme going on color palette wise, but it's also that same grey and orange that's all over the menu vibes here, and moreover, the VR. Which, man, I don't know what that is, but that's some fucking design intent right there. Same way the tanker ray is blue to match the orange lighting of the hold, but the mass-produced rays are orange to match the bluer blues of Arsenal. Which is all pretty wild, not gonna lie. MGS2 be the type of game where even the fucking seagulls are relatively high-poly, high-texture. These fucking birds have more definition than the NPCs in Final Fantasy X do. Oh, on the flip side, the similarly cine arsenal gear is... Well, it's not the most impressive looking thing now that I can just spin it around in clear view. It doesn't even have a town on its head. Just, just, just take some of this New York skyline and put it on there. Boom. Sin. I fucking adore, however, however much it lets the player no clip about town. For the same reasons, I'm baffled by Codec Colonel and Seagull, I'm also really impressed by the fact that the New York skyline is in 3D. Like, I was dead certain these shits were PNGs, but nah. The detail on these arches on bridge, the pipes and girders of the boat you barely even get to see at any point, or the upside down rooms for reflections all own as well. While gliding through the spooky halls, I can't help but get a little cinematic with it. And while flying across the big shell, I also realized that, dang, that's one fucking model. Yes, there's detail that gets filled in once you get there, and of course, stuff does get called out that needn't be depending too, but it's still such a crazy technical feat that they had the whole damn thing. Shit like this really got me to wonder about a few other technicalities I've been curious about for my entire life. Like in Start L, the hole here always sort of looked too real to me. Too sharp. Maybe pre-rendered? Like, like the lighting of it and shit? But goddamn, no, no, it's just really clever use of baked shadows and colored fog effects. Something else I was really curious about was the lip movements. Cause... I mean, they look good, but they do seem a little funky to me, and given that the codec, again, uses 3D models, I always wondered how they handled making all of that. Like, there's no way these faces were mo-capped. Movements, yeah, but these faces are definitely not mo-capped. 
Konami wasn't on that train in general. The PS2 Silent Hills all have entirely hand-animated cutscenes, which is sicko shit. And it would have been even bigger sicko shit here. However, as the wildingly in-depth devlogs and debriefs show, they actually developed a lip-sync creation tool that would automatically move along with whatever audio it would have been given, which explains how they could shit out so much talking head content in several languages, no less. And that's another thing as well. The behind the scenes info on this disc is downright disgusting. Games don't normally give you access to actual lines of code and in-depth discussions to how they made it all work relative to the system it was made for. Sometimes maybe you get little snippets of design docs and concept art, but you defo don't just get the entire whole fucking thing like you do here. All the initial plannings and keywords, RPG, 3D, the usual whims of the era, and even game design instructions directly from Kojima's Lego desk itself. Being able to scroll through all the level sketches, appreciating how small the game is technically while also being made acutely aware of all the volumes of planning and work that had to have gone into this. The many hands that would have touched these very pages and the input that those whom those hands have belonged to would have had to have given. I already know from the making of movie that everyone had their own notebooks to jot down ideas in. That's where things like the wall leans and real hangings came from, but seeing all these in context of their positions developer messages really hammers home how much of a team effort a game of this scale is going to be. Putting faces and names and a hint of personality to all of MGS2's aspects. The chronological timeline fittingly displaying who had kids or who went on temp leave to learn new things during dev, and their individual words showcasing how in sync the team was as well. All sharing takes in line with the themes of MGS2, what they want to pass on and how they hope to impact the industry and change the world. Oh, it even directly mentions BBSs, which I'd wager was a huge impact on the digital flow and control villain narrative people often pass off as predictive, though I can assure you that shit was alive and well back then. Especially in Japan, as other works like the Silver Case or Lane Display that shit had a bit more cultural heft already than it did for Americans at the time. Not to say that the ending isn't amazing, don't get me wrong, but again, I think if you're thinking that the AI was spitting, you probably have some dark things to work out. As message-wise and dev mentality-wise, MGS2 stands as a strong fuck you to that weird cucked message boardian nihilism. Anyway, uh... Yeah, you know, I guess it's cute to know that the sediment pool was almost a botanical garden. Probably would have made for a fun as heck jungle evil style boss fight. And also shout out the early big shell being just the oil drill platform. And shout out the untextured rooms. Or shout out this goddamn 9-11 shit they had to cut out of the game. God bless the USA. Oh, uh... Also, the plot thickens on the VR guards ex Copplethorn ex Gurlagon Acid 2 universe as we have Mei Ling for Tune Shading Experiment, making me wonder if there's a alt IRL universe where MGS2 would have looked like Acid 2, or if Acid 2 was merely expanding on work done here. Uh, would explain why they'd reference the Copplethorn thing as a nod, at least. There's also trading cards, which is defo what Acid was based on. Ain't gonna lie though, what I saw them calling this bitch MGS3, which which that that I mean I mean that's like that, that's like Metal Gear 3 to become MGS3 become solid 2. My mind has been torn asunder! And then this penis butt voiceover calling the big shell Big Blue Apple was built in Manhattan Bay to clean up the mess. However, even a year after the accident, there was very little progress in the cleanup process. Over this skung looking tanker footage, I, I knew I needed to step the fuck back. There's way more content here, but if I start digging into this for real, this video is gonna end up being like four hours long and I don't want that. That said, if you're a big MGS2 fan, I think that this is easily where you'll find the good substance of substance. Smoke the disc. It is many, it is plenty. Fucked up how there's even more VR missions on this disc too. I ain't touching them. I am VR the fuck out right now, but, but they're there.
Luckily for me, I suppose I'm not the only one done with VR missions, being that they don't really return in the later installments. Yeah, yeah, that's right, bitch. It's time for the legacy of VR. See, three didn't have any, as it had the virtuous mission. A virtuous mission. Virtual mission. Virtuous mission. Virtuous mission. Which I'm gonna take as a way for the game to say that all of that creative design is just in there now. But uh, <laughs> we'll get to that soon. Four didn't have any either, though being as much of a set piece shebang as it be, maybe you could have used them. And Portable Ops, Peace Walker, and V do have the type of content that would have side moded into VR or otherwise in the other installments, but due to the mission based structure these three would develop, all of it is very much just worked into the natural progression of the story, side quests if you will, rather than modes per se. Spin off wise, Metal Gear, Ghost Babel and fucking Rising actually do have VR missions. The latter's is have a cool cube world of pink, yellow and blue which is rather acidic indeed. And I like that you get to play more as Helmetless Raiden, though they are ostensibly just tutorials with unskippable voice lines and also I don't want to beat the game again to unlock all of these, but they're neat for what they is. And Babusi's missions are pretty much Game Boy D makes of what MGS1 had, which is really cute. In a way, for this game, it's odd how simplistic these are, cause Babel already had design that squeezes and milks its every item and mechanic for what they were worth and scoring and ranking built in by default. And for real, this shit goes deep for only two buttons. Wall leaning, crawling, knocking, swimming, sounds, tons of unique things like floodings and even the solid on radar are all present and accounted for. So in that, it's interesting how its VR missions are really the most pure sneak around these men's in the whole ass series. Scrunging down one's weapons and sneakings and I also don't care to unlock these missions to something perfect for quick blasts on the go. Wait, hold the fuck on. Is this also in the Gurlogon verse? Stranger yet is that when you beat the whole VR Uzi, as someone on the hex site Reddit did, you get to see an acknowledgement of Raiden pre MGS2's release. It is a alternate universe Raiden in the Coppelthornian sense, granted, as he's training off a snake's efforts in the Galuade incident, i.e., alternate universe Shadow Moses, i.e., Ghost Babel's story, but that's still cute as a button. Reminds me of how in Metal Gear mobile, the whole twist turns out to be that you were in a simulation all along. Which then also leads into a ridening, but one of the canon varieties. Or pining to be at least, taking place in between 1 and 2, and much as such, VR in general will still be a part of the series narratively regardless of if any future games will acknowledge it interactively. That said, if 3 is anything to go by, it really won't need to with its various virtuous fun new directions. But before we get to that, it is time for Patron. Solid Snake, Metal Gear Solid, Ghost Babel, Konami, Kellogg, Cartback, Tony Tiger. Huh. Now, I don't mean to brag, but I have quite a bit of experience fighting dangerous beasts. And so, I can very well handle what MGS3 has to offer. Like goats. Pretty tasty. <laughs> So, <laughs> I guess you could say it was <laughs> goaded. <laughs> Crabs, frogs, rabbits, and the general treacherous nature of the forest. I can become the forest. Meld with it. Like a true master of stealth gameplay, really embracing its many in-depth mechanics once again. And that's because MGS3 is all about survival and jungle stealth. 
involving food, hunger, medical work, less Lego-y levels, and a whole lot more of them too, with a playful playset of weaponry to use within. MGS3 is damn near a heckin' immersive sim, with every situation tackleable in about a dozen different ways, and every item a expansive breadth of potential use cases. Two's coolant turned into a design philosophy, pretty much. Like how one can light up the cave with a cigar, with gun shoots, with torch, with waiting for snake's eyesight to adjust, or simply by using some goggles one may have found earlier while exploring. It's also possible to blow up food storage huts to make guards hungrier and thus act different. The player can use the level designs against them in general, shooting beehives or chucking poisonous scorpions on them and shit, knife to slice guy, knife to harvest plant, and knife to remove bullet wound. Enter literally every building through holes, from roofs with doors or by bursting through the windows. Hell, even the menus are a playset of possibility onto themselves. To be honest, I can never get over this frog. Like its pose, the stance, the expression. It is entirely unimpressed with my shit. Pretty tasty. And it's pretty tasty. And man, goddamn, the fucking codec calls up in this bitch. <laughs> you best believe I knew all there was to know about the Otten Frog before I consumed its essence. Just as how I received the freaky deaky down low on every single object or situation. Is there a way to take off my pants? Well, three may lack the tactile pick up everything, first person nature that the genre is known for. It otherwise ticks all the imsimi boxes of immersive, emergent, creative and expressive gameplay far as I'm concerned, and so VR just wasn't needed to milk its mechanics. And yet, even still, the subsistence release of MGS3 packs a whopping three discs regardless, with the first containing the main game with added tweaks and additions, new camos, unlockables, a third person spinnable camera that makes things a fuck of a whole lot more playable. The second disc features a boss rush mode, a monkey mode that gave the thumbnail its vibe, and the old MSX games, which are actually really cool and still worth smoking, should be on the recent HD collection too, so check them out. And finally, also Metal Gear Online, which... <sighs> I had a long, long, hard think about this, because I'm supremely fucking interested. I mean, th th this is where the two women's are from, from the screenshots of key images of Pryor's mention. But it's like, there's a Rumble Roses cameo, and <laughs> that alone, for my purposes, would mean that I have no choice but to scope out that entire series. And talk about his weirdo art book, which entirely consists out of renders of sexy bitches, and just... <sighs> See what I mean? I think, I fear, and I know that I'm going to have to save Metal Gear Online for its own video, as cop outy as that might sound. This'll go for fours and fives onlines as well, as they're their entire own games with unique vibes, lores, dev histories, and so on. Plus, the technicals for setting those up to play would be quite complicated, and I just don't want to blow this video's production up any further. There's a little fuck old as online is where the snake meets of snake eaters subsistence is at considering that disc 3 contains nothing more than a MGS 3D movie HD all cutscenes full story every ending type YouTube video but official with really scungy machinima bits abridging the gameplay and some really awkward editing to get around the codex not sure what the point of this even was maybe the desire to blow that movie load was simply too ah. strong uh, I hope they had fun making it then, I guess. And I suppose there is also a MGS4 trailer showing off that MGS3 cell processor tech with the duckies and everything, but from a modern POV, this is just crustier versions of shit that's already out there HD online. So, yeah, with no online monk mode aside, there isn't all that much here sidewise. No document, no skateboarding, and no overwhelming volumes of VR missions. Not that it needed any of that, but just for this video's purposes, right? That said, then again, now that I think about it, the story itself actually does have a demo in it akin to skate that one can access via Dream. Damn, dog. 
You got the whole squad mind boggled. The screen fades as dudes jankily pop in and come gunning towards you alongside a eerie, windy whisper filling up the soundscape. Already, before I'd even pressed any buttons or had processed what was happening, the dream had left a rather unfinished, broken sort of impression. As if this alpha gameplay debug room the player suddenly gets sucked into. The fences, crates, the ground texture, and even the slightly bossy in suits all reek of repurposed MGS3 assets. But scrambled, distorted, and contorted into a familiar yet unrecognizable horror. Which is, dare I say it, uncanny. Thing is, this is indeed a for fun made test build demo thingy for a edgy, bloody, grimy PS2 action game made in MGS3's engine during dev on the side. Looking back at it, it's like, yeah, th th there were dozens of games like this, of course they were planning stuff, but as a kid who at this point in time, less so, but still a little bit, feared my virusian fears, stumbling into this dream au naturel simply by saving in the cell was quite impactful. I hadn't played anything like Chaos Legion or the immensely bloody Nano Breaker, so seeing blood fountains erupting from zombie pigs slain by the dozen by my edgy coated dual wielding funny bladed protag was not only cool as heck, but also pretty dang scary. Like, shit freaked me out for real. Especially when you go into that spree mode rage state thing where the heartbeat ramps up. It, it's pretty raw. Like, I do think this could have been a fun full game, though among the sea of shits, maybe nothing too noteworthy, but within this specific dream context, it becomes so much more than that. Being that the dream gets subtly built up to, with Snake alluding to fearing vampires and them giving him nightmares all the way back in cave while dealing with bats. Paramedic then calls back to this when saving in the cell and so then when you turn off your system and load thine save, the dream boots up in its janky fashion. Not only is this comparatively tonally much more grim and gory than anything MGS3 offers, thus offering a contrast with it and making its impact more impactful as a result, but it's also this perversion of a dumb running gag. One of many that end up being just fine. Say what? My pants, can I? Oh hell no! This Fox unit is a nut fest! <laughs> I mean, the pants stuff I played earlier is part of a little codec plot thread about Sigint becoming increasingly more freaked out by these assholes. There's a whole thing about whether or not Snake looks cool based around the many dumb items you can wear and in general 3 is easily the funniest Metal Gear there is. And so it's interesting that this is pre-nanos as it demolishes the fourth wall, usually for comedic effect granted, but still at every single turn. Letting the player pull shit like killing a boss with old age simply by waiting in real life or speeding up the PS2 system clock. Or how you're haunted by a fucking ghost who supplies you with cheats and shit. There's something creepy about that, especially with how he confronts you with your very real ass vivid ass kill count and can only be seen otherwise in first person, but regardless. From the spinning to puking to the mushroom, the battery to sleeping to the breast implanting the Eva-ing, MGS3 is constantly using its meta gameplay centric narrative fourth wall breaking to make funny. And yeah, sure, I was still a dumb enough kid to be scared by the fucking hunger bar. Like, I didn't know how that shit worked. I didn't know Snake's stomach would start to growl when hungry. <laughs> yeah, my ass thought that that was a bear or whatever. A scary thing not to get me. Come on, they're not that bad for you. If you end up growing huge like that, you won't have any place left to hide. Just like a girl who gone. Oh my god. He is canon! But even still, I was quite acutely aware of how much of a turn it was to have one of those jokes turn on you by contorting familiar environmental elements and other such subconscious noticeables into a gory, scary nightmare. 
Ooh, we are nasty. Anyway... Metal Gear Solid wasn't the only key pillar game on PS1 to be way ahead of its time, revolutionizing and influencing many a thing. As one such release was the legendary Ape Escape, a game that dared to ask, uh, what if we used both analog sticks for something? Wow. Woo! Just wow. Incredible. Amazing. Such ingenuity. I joke, but shit for real was a big deal, being that the N64 only had one of these bitches and the Saturn straight up had none. So now suddenly it was like, ah, dang, eh, with this functionality, all controllers will have to be built with two twiddle nipples in the future. That's just how it has to go and be. And it was. Yeah, that's right. You feel bad about yourself. That game didn't even use it for the camera, which really fucking shows. But the fact that it used it at all, despite the analog PS1 controller having been out for a minute was still a decently big deal. Suddenly, these two sticks went from being a gimmick to being a necessary thing. You needed those to play Ape Escape, just like how you'd need those to play virtually any PS2 game following thereafter. Part of that, admittedly, is also due to 2 having 2 by default 2, but AE made its mark regardless on PlayStation and games history in general around the same time MGS1 did with its, whoa, hey, someone actually used movie directing techniques in a game cutscene, we should try that too, Inspiration. Dang, it even ties into the wireframe VR theme. Yeah, I'm just gonna pretend I planned it like that. Well, it's not quite a hot damsel in distress, but it is a rescue mission. Rescuing who? Apes. What? Monkeys. But not just any monkeys. You said monkeys? Just listen. Hey, see? Oh, that's how that shit's done. None of, none of that fucking text bullshit from the snake tails. Just, just goddamn real shit. Seven maps. BB gun the apes to knock them out. To rush on over and touch to capture. No time limit, but a timer for score. Cause quickness is of the essence. This be because these primates don't wait. No trank means no sleep. Only spinny stars and they get back up fast and move even faster while active. And that brings quite a unique energy to something so dumb, fast and arcadey being presented through the snake eater style. Still taking place inside quiet jungles, these lush, lifelike maps ruffling beyond bushes and climbing trees while not being blasted with the DMB and only solely the sounds of nature. It is as if a meticulous hunt, the creature crittering for food, turned into the primary primate focus. Which he does expertly, of course, sporting him's iconic banana camo. Don't know how much that helps, seeing as these fuckers move like cartoon characters never sitting still and will hawk their shit at a man upon sight. But there isn't really a penalty per se for getting got, and thus speed becomes the meticulous monkey meta. Just BB those bitches ASAP and scoop them up prim and proper as stated prior. All the while seeing these areas in a different light. Like it's quite the shift in experience dealing with enemies whom you are trying to fight rather than avoid. And so, I had no idea I could walk up on the rafters of the shago hanger. Nor did I really ever have to use the tree stumps and trenches myself, but the monkeys most certainly do. You really gotta learn to learn where they are, more better each run, trying to get the bestest times while using the fact that they are even less camoed up than Banana Boy over here to one's advantage. It's... Like, it's not entirely unlike the VR missions, I guess, if way smaller in scope. But hey, I mean the Colonel is here and it's modern day snake from the time paradox, so connections are implied at the very least. And much like the pizza moment, I would also be surprised upon, upon which where this goes. Thing is, at first, it was just a bunch of roll games, right? You're mine. Unorganized, bumbling, dare I say it, stupid. But, during the third mission, it became evident that some type of organization was being conducted. A rebellion? An uprising? Suddenly, I spotted them sipping tea, working the furnace. 
This entire facility in ruins as it may be now belonged to the apes. And before long, Mesogear Gear came into the picture. Yo, snake. In Japanese, monkey is saru. And when you put that together with metal, you get mesel. Now, now I know that might sound like you don't, but snake try- Mesaru, of course. It makes sense in that Kojima way. Just like how it makes sense to turn the shago on into a giant creepy red-eyed monkey tank with spinning drills that activate when you see it. And while it ends there, here, there is a other side to this coin of monkey bits. Computer Entertainment, Entertainment America. America presents Ape Escape 3, a whole ass tiny MGS game within the Ape Escape engine framework. Snake Man's, Guard Man's, Lego Levels. The map is here, the guns is here, the rations. Really, the only difference is that it uses the simian controls, and so you're using analog sticks for things you'd normally never ever use them for. But as weird as that is, it still works. It's got the weapon sensitivity down at least, and cocking guns to shoot with a stick flick is pretty neat as well. Besides, it's managing the wall leaning and hanging, and the mother heckin' box, and many much more, all in cool, context-sensitive fashion. Only major downside, I'd argue, is that the camera is wholly locked down. True, yes, twas that way in OG3 too, so I can't really fault it for it per se, but also maybe it's just that smidge too zoomed in here. Which can be a little a lot of awkward, though I guess I don't mind that much at all. I'm mainly just impressed by how faithful the level design is, really. At least by 2-in-1 standards. Boasting many a crawl space, speakable, hideable, and camera, and hey, there's even fucking boss fights. Put some fun twists on shit as well, like having a cluster of cameras set about a moving pillar or using the bomb wall basement shit post basement as a thing featured in many a area that can be backtracked towards for optional goodies. <sighs> yeah, this... <laughs> this is fucking Metal Gear, all right. It's even got the dog tags, which I really wasn't expecting. Shout out to the sexy booby posters, too. That way you know it's legit. Similar to how it'd be in 3, though, the guards can only be knocked out, and they also still get up quicker, so it keeps that faster pace of the smunky mode. Alert phases are also short as shit, and they're dumb as bricks, which all contributes to a arcadier quickness that Metal Gear gameplay has kind of lacked post-MSX. And similar to MSX MGS, it follows 2's blueprint to a T. L like, like Metal Gear 2. Not Solid 2, but I guess also Solid 2. And Ghost Babels. And going by the opening, they probably took it more directly from Onesies. But, but 1 is 1 and 2 is 1, so... Uh, hence why it opens upon a uh, make it to the elevator and sneak past the mines, and it has the played out Metal Gear staple of Cowboy Town. You know how it'd be. Luckily though, it's all been cuted with big red buttons to open doors and very obvious blow walls. There's even little igloos outside and a sort of Awamori festival ape thing, and the mines are big cartoon bombs. This all then is followed by laser dodging and ledge hanging and PC bombing, and so on and so forth. It's a very very adorable pastiche of Snake Manian, Guard Manian design concepts executed scrimboliciously. Right down to how it has that soft rounded look just about all PS2 platformers had. It's neat. Even has helpful bootleg snake codex to explain it all as well. It's ahead of it, and I'm checking out what state Metal Gear is in. That's strange. I thought I heard something starting up. Being that it does continue the story primarily through them. Because, you see, during his exploits finding Messel Gear, Snake has gone missing. So Campbell, with nowhere else to turn, turns to the Professor to deal with this new mecha threat. Regrettably, the anime children are on summer camp. Summer camp? This is a national emergency. This is a once-in-a-lifetime educational experience. Thus, they send in Peepo Snake, a monkey who, just like Raiden, trained in VR to become a solid snake copy. Will he be able to save Snake? Will he stop Messel Gear? And will he find out who's behind it all? The fuck is Metal Gear Acid Link? 
Hmm. Link to Metal Gear Acid for PSP? Like, like what through USB? Okay, let's try. Okay, so I have it set up, but it's like, it's grayed out. Hello? Yeah? Why the fuck is it grayed out? No! no. Whoa, a Metal Gear Acid Limited Edition card book? <gasps> Wir kommen sehr nun in Acid Welt von Metal Gear. Ich bin mir sicher, sie werden Metal Gear Acid. The problem was, was that I needed a completely finished Acid save file, and I, I ain't fucking doing that again, even if you paid me. Oh, some of y'all are, and I still ain't doing it. I remember what I went through back in retrospective, and that game is unfair as fuck continue-wise and tedious ass later down the line. Looked and sounded amazing, I suppose, though no extra content outside of 3Link. Which I believe only gets you some extra cards to use on your now finished save file anyway. Now, 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 Acid 2, on the other hand, does many such things. In the Coppelthornian sense, of course. Chiefly VR, but as in like actual VR goggles, like Oculus and whatever the heck garbage shit. I have a PSVR 2 and it's still in the box, and it's not coming out of the box until I smoke Talking Dogs, announced teaser, PS5 and PSVR 2 games. Cause man, look at this game. <laughs> Breath of the Dogs, Dog Bandicoot? This got it all. Oh yeah, Acid 2 has the infamous porn goggles, which one can use to view women's in 3D in VR. Being VR-wise a bit of a middle ground between the virtual boy and Google Cardboard. Bearing the pain of the former and the, well, cardboard of the latter. See, to see, I had to cross my eyes a little bit, and while that certainly did give off a neat 3D effect, the red warnings of eye strain also began to make sense to me pretty much right away. Whatever it is I have to do to configure my eyes to focus on this is not how I do it to look normally, and so hence, head hurty. But uh, I suppose it works, and yeah, for what it's worth, it ain't just a titty mode either. As just about every card in the game, which is a lot gives way to a little video. Snippets of MGS3 cutscenes, an MGS4 trailer, more snippets of MGS3 cutscenes, girls, snippets of MGS3 cutscenes, a really brief Rumble Roses cameo for some reason, and even some more snippets of MGS3 cutscenes. Enhanced question mark with the gimmick of cardboard VR, giving MGS3 in 3D B4 3DS MGS3 in 3D, which is kind of neat, I suppose. There's also depth to the girlages too, in that certain cards will result in you seeing videos of the girls engaging with the item. Like how Survival Knife shows a girl with a uh, gun, or how the box car shows a girl in a army uniform, or how Choke shows also a girl in a army uniform. Look, okay, uh, maybe, maybe they just needed to work out the specifics a little more, but it is more than just a dumb theater. It is a dumb theater with effort and a stupid peripheral, and I like that. Hmm. Uh... Uh, did record all of this off of actual PSP, by the way. Set up a retro tank with it, and thus now I got 1080p PSP real hardware live. Goddamn childhood save files from 2008 and everything. Anyway, a uh, horny bullshit like this kind of stood at the center of the PSP in many ways. The titular horny dark age I brought up before in this video. 
I want to do a unmonetizable vid on this with the homie Hazel someday as there is a lot to talk about here, culturally and contextually, that led to many inclusions as such. Though, TLDR, for some time, Japanese publishers became more and more convinced, especially on handhelds, that sex was needed to sell, as what was selling mostly only was dating simi games with the brunt of the JP market moving to mobile. I honestly don't know how true that actually was, but that's how shit's often reported on, and that is also why Killer is Dead Gigolo Mode, Third Birthday Shower Scene Unlocks, and why even Acid 1 let the player unlock woman guards. Granted, if I'm really honest, shit is it not textbook quote unquote a Hideo Kojima game neither. I don't think MGS4 was in any danger of not selling, and 5 was way past this point in time, and yet still quiet and the BNB core. Speaking of the former, by the way, for as far as for site content goes, there was of course MGO, which I ain't touching for this, and otherwise I'm pretty sure it was just a database. Which is kinda like the document of Metal Gear, but actually more so just a way to retcon shit so that MGS4 could work and so that the player could be well informed on well important informative lore on Dirty Duck from the Eggplant Gang. And also, as oh, no. stated prior in reference to VR, because of the switch to a mission-based structure in Portable Ops, Peace Walker, and V, these titles wouldn't really have side content per se. Portable Ops, I guess, did receive its own sort of subsistence type VR mission separate release type release titled Portable Ops Plus, where the story was actually crowbarred out, I'm guessing due to disk space and subsequence for a beefy multiplayer experience that I can't access, which can carries on the lore and style of MGO, being that that's honestly mostly what this is a spin-off of more than anything. But Peace Walker and V just put all the wacky silly side shit inside the base game, like the Monster Hunter crossover and the horny bullshit in Peace Walker, or the, uh, the, the repetitive side quests in V. And for what it's worth, 5 did have its own online released as a standalone, and one could also very well argue that Survive is the 5 as what VR missions was the 1, and I really really liked Survive. I highly recommend checking it out if you were too busy being a butthurt little pee baby when it came out, and can now hopefully approach it with an open mind. It's a rather unique experience, repurposing Metal Gear mechanics and maps in quite interesting ways, and furthers the idea that the series can be horror very cutely as well. And that's basically where the series ends for now. Obviously, there's Delta coming out soon and whatever that may have in store for us, and there's a new collection too that sadly misses some of the side stuff for technical and legal reasons, like the skating and monkeying, which is also part of why I wanted to in-depthly document all of this beforehand. Does have some cool bonus books that are somewhat document-y in nature though, uh, I support it. Uh, okay. Besides, it ain't like Kojima was just out here snoozing. He made a Death Stranding and that landing got its very own subsistency re-release. Even brought back the Ape Escape for a single tweet, which I must say is fucking adorable. But then also, they took out the monster energy and now the whole entire integrity of the game is ruined! You know, if I were to design like a VR chamber or some shit, I'd probably make it- No way. No way. Nah. No fucking way, dog. Holy shit! Death Stranding DX is goddamn VR mission! I, I mean, I don't call them that. It's the shooting range, but everything about this is everything about this. Its entire format, the whole vibe, the way it looks and sounds and works, it's fucking VR missions. Which makes sense as well, seeing as Death Stranding has the same playful, multifunctional design. Like, I think just like how differently I played it this time around is already such a testament to that. No longer cargo carrying, truck using, road relying like I was last time, being that I always had tons of shit on me. Nah, I was traveling lightly, being less afraid of disposable runoutables and breakables, building zipline networks, wheelie biking, barely carrying any standard cargo, and focusing on doing as many deliveries as fast as possible at once. So right now. Like right now. 
<laughs> oh, okay there, buddy. This should be on an episode of Rock Long Readers. Fuck yeah. God damn it, Sam. And the other reason why the VR inclusion super checks out is because, well, it already does the simulated spaces thing, as well as it building its meta into the narrative with the repatriate stuff and all of the nano machine like overlays and menuisms that it derives from both. For instance, there's floating text and data everywhere, blending in so seamlessly with the UI that there's zero distinction between what is only for the player to see and what is actually there in world with everything from likes and cutscenes to the actual fucking vertices of the level geometry being made apparent upon a scan. And so hence, the VR. DX also makes tons of other additions to the base game, like there's a bunch of new items, a few new deliveries with more interior spaces, and... Or pooping, Johnny? <sighs> and the VR, of course, also unlocks new missions with every one such item to pair up with. And while none of this is side content per se, we do have a whole entire app of optionality on the PS5 menu, akin to a second substuci disc filled with wonders such as... a mini soundtrack and some art. Uh, well... Okay, the document of Death Stranding, this is most certainly not this. Mini OSTs, like 8 tracks, which, alright, fine. But the art I really like, being that that's A, not just shit you'd see shitted all over YouTube already, and B, goddamn Die Hard Man Ocelot concept art and Olga Eva Mama, like, what? Shout out Yoji Shinkawa, for real. One of the best to ever do it. They translated all the little designer notes too, which is cute, but it does kind of, in a way, make me feel like it's a smidge of a shame that they went with actor likenesses over Shinkawa's drawn faces, because man has a way with shit. Though, either way, I adore Death Stranding's entire vibe and aesthetic overall regardless, so this was really cool for me to peruse as I got a better look at things, like the cities, or the BTs with less of their abstractions and all the cool tech and shit, and then it's like, fuck you, by the book, bitch. So... Yeah, kind of mid as far as bonus content goes compared to what we got prior, but I suppose it didn't really need to have anything at all. It's all bonus either way. And the additions to the base game are far meatier than what any of the Metal Gears got, so it's a glass half full type beat. Uh, you know, uh, uh, half full of shit. Mm, nice. GBA deviations aside, the last two retrospective parts were about defining Kojima, what a Hideo Kojima game even really meant, and also to then establish what a defo didn't mean, the spare extension doing what I had been doing, i.e. shining a light on the greater teams behind the games that bear his name through shining a light on the man himself. With Death Stranding, I was like, hey, even this game people are saying is very different is provably Super Kojima as fuck. Then ending it by saying that that's also just a product of him lugging around the same team a lot. And then the Snatcher video was all like, here's traits I can trace back to him specifically as a person that infests the games he works on as a overall writer, director, and designer, and so on. I plan to contrast these things from here on out to games that officially bear his name as a marketing thing or are just more commonly associated with him like games that he produced but didn't write or design as a means to then show that he ain't always the man behind the wheel and that there's hella talented folks working with him with that in mind these are pretty interesting things to look at as they are side person things by nature like I mean, the spin-off games are almost all exercises at letting new younger talent have a go at making a Metal Gear Solid game. And so I was wondering if the side content would have been made entirely, well, on the side, by folks who may not have had much to do or just have had some neat ideas to add or just as fluff by fluff divisions or as demos of later concepts or even entirely outsourced. And where I was able to highlight some innovations made in VR that would later be made real and shit like the dream and skate, 
for the most part, no. As far as I can tell, it's all in-house as fuck. The credits of VR missions, for instance, mirror those of MGS1, if just a little bit smaller. Nakamura doing vibrations, Kojima designing and directing, Tappy doing tunes, and so on. Even with Acid 2, which is a Shinta no Jerry joint rather than Kojima, the credits for the goggles are all just folks who did dev overall, including Shinta. <laughs> The cheeky genius. I suppose the videos of the girls were outsourced to a girl video studio, but otherwise, uh, nah, yeah, from online and ape to VR and dream, these are all just what they are, and so I can't be like, actually, this up and coming design genius spearheaded the Gurlugan missions, cause. Ko Kojima is Ginola? What do you mean Kojima is Ginola? Mocap? Is he a giant? Wow, such deep games.